Living Adventurously is brought to you in partnership with Kamut, the route planning and navigation app that helps you make the most of your outdoor adventures. Whether you're cycling, hiking, running or bikepacking, Kamut's easy to use technology will get you out the door and exploring more of the great outdoors. You can see where I've been exploring by checking out the highlights of my journey on Kamut. Just follow the link in the show notes. My name is Alistair Humphreys. I set out on a bicycle journey around Yorkshire to speak to interesting, ordinary people who, in very different ways, are making an effort to live adventurously. I wanted to talk about what they do, about the barriers they've faced along the way, and to seek their perspective on some of the big questions that all of us encounter in our lives. Welcome to Living Adventurously. <laughs> I've written here, needs intro music. Um, okay, here we go. Um... <laughs> That'll do. I have a love-hate relationship with book publishers. I hated them for the years they rejected all my writing, seeing them as a overly powerful gatekeeper to the world of books. But I've also loved publishers when they have helped, um, when they've published my books, when they decide to give birth to my writing for me. But one thing I have always enjoyed are my conversations with publishers. I love fellow book geeks who are happy to natter for ages about adventure writing. Vertebrate Publishing is at the very heart of British adventure, um, adventure writing and outdoor sports. And it was started by John Barton 15 years ago. I met John at Vertebrate HQ to ask him about the lessons he's learned from starting a publishing company, about the discrepancy in numbers between male and female authors in this genre. And I also asked him about his scorn for self-titled adventurers like me, who spend a lot of time talking about themselves on the internet. Today I'm with John from Vertebrate Publishing. Thank you very much for fitting me into your busy post-holiday day and for making me a cup of tea. Um, what I love about what you guys do is the, the battle you seem to go through to try and give small, niche, but important adventure stories a voice. Is that... Is that a fair summary? Have I missed what you're up to? I think I think it started off as an inability to say no. So I think we just wanted to publish everything. Uh, and I think we 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 always had the mantra that if 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 we wanted to if a book was the sort of thing we'd we'd use or read ourselves, we'd publish it. And then we just ended up publishing loads because Climbing guidebooks, running guidebooks, walking guidebooks, just take you to inspiring places. Um, and so we just, just started publishing as much as we could do and we attracted a lot of a lot of authors who possibly couldn't get published elsewhere. People hadn't heard of the adventures or the mountains they were going to climb. Um, so we yeah, we we just we just published and published and published. Um and then then we started panicking about the money running <laughs> out. Sell some. <laughs> well, I love, um, we were talking earlier, I love that you publish uh, Tillman's books. And I think a lot of people won't have heard of him, but uh, Tillman's books were one of my early introductions into adventure writing. The idea that, not uh, look at this guy, not only is he epic, hardcore, tough, he's also well-read and writes funny, clever books. So... Why? Why do you start? Why do you do niche books like Tillman? Does anyone buy those? Uh, I mean, one of the strengths of what we try and do is to is to keep things in print, keep books in print, and I I think I personally think Tillman is one of our finest ever travel writers. I think I think as a, as a person, he's he's fascinating. He. He he sort of he grew up in colonial Africa. He he did loads of first ascents in Africa. Met a guy called Shipton uh, as a, as a young man. He's he's going to the Himalayas. He's doing 
he, he did the first ascent of Nanda Devi, which uh, I'm not very good at my history, I think was the highest mountain climbed at that time. He he went on, he was he was on Everest. He he came back to Europe uh, to fight in the war. He was in special forces. He was captured. He was parachuted behind enemy lines. He liberated cities. He he then, by his own admission, started getting a bit too old for high altitude climbing. So he got himself a a, a small boat and went. Uh, looking for islands, unexplored islands with unclimbed mountains. A boat called Mischief. A boat called Mischief. Uh, so he wrote a series of, of books about his mountains and then he wrote a series about his, his exploring Arctic and Antarctic lands in his little boat, which sank. <laughs> and then I think his next one sank. Uh, and then the guy's in his 80s and he, he disappears off on another expedition and indeed disappeared in the South Atlantic. Tragic, uh, but just a, a hero. Um, and I think one of the things here we do is is we, we have to make space to keep books in print. You know, there's Chris Bonington's written a whole number of books that, you know, a lot of the old ones out of print. Uh, Doug Scott's the same, loads of mountaineers. Uh, so in, in all of our publishing uh, and I'm rambling a bit now. In all of our publishing, we like to make space. Uh, and I think Tillman, Tillman, uh, you know, you've got to read a Tillman book. They're just, they're just astounding. And um, I know from writing books myself and trying to pester publishers that uh, publishers get pestered constantly, huge amounts of submissions of the famous slush piles of people trying to get their books out. And is there any anything in general you can notice between? The younger people doing adventures now versus the, the these sort of old classic books that have stood the test of time. I think with a lot of books we get sent, you know, some some are very good and some are very interesting, and some ha haven't really moved on to the sort of books that Tillman and Shipton were writing. Um, so, you know, so some you can easily sort of say, look. That's been written, you know, written seventy years ago. Um, I think, I think uh, there are people now, and, we, and we, we're spending a bit more time being trying to be a bit more adventurous, looking for new writers. I think we we we've, we've done a lot of backlist stuff. Um, we've done a lot of sort of old mountaineers memoirs. But I think going forward, we are we are looking for d different takes. Um, and different interesting things and, and, and looking at different sorts of people to write. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the things we did realize were the dreaded Amazon bestsellers lists, the, the mountaineering, hundred best mountaineering books, uh, 99% of them are written by women. Uh, sorry, by men, <laughs> not by women at you all. You saw the look on my face. <laughs> None of them are written by, uh, you know, typically when we, when we looked at it two years ago and we thought, Oh, look at this. We look, all of our submissions were coming in from men. All the books were written by men except possibly one book. Uh, there'll be Nan Shepherd's book, maybe Gwen Moffat's book, uh, and then Bernadette MacDonald's, which would typically be a biography of a man. So so one one thing we did do, we, we did a book called, called Waymaking, which was just an anthology of women's writing. That's my next thing that I'll oh. ask you about, Waymaking. <laughs> yeah. I, I th way, it's... A beautiful book um and actually one of the things i really like about a lot of your books is that they're not just books but they're really nice they're beautiful they, you put a lot of work into that waymarking is beautiful but it's an anthology of women in adventure isn't it mm. um and i think that is important but also it just stands alone to fantastic books how was what was the um the process of putting all that together like well the 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 point of it was 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 because uh, I was getting a little bit bored of. Uh, I was a bit of a loner at school. I wasn't very good at sport. Somebody taught me hill walking. I loved it. Somebody taught me rock climbing. I loved it. I climbed the north face of the Iger, and then I went to the Himalayas and I had an accident. Here's my book, <laughs> and <laughs> and it and it was pretty much you know one one ascent of north face of the Iger uh, after another. Um, so, and fifty percent of the population is women. And you just go out there and there's huge, you know, huge numbers of women 
running around on the hills and doing stuff and but they're not they weren't particularly represented in the literature and i think for us us to be a sort of a a, a publisher that specializes in, in adventure books we had to go and do something so so we just put a lot of effort into and well the editors helen mort and camilla barnard and uh Heather Door and uh, so once you start naming people, you're gonna it's a ter- <laughs> always a terrible mistake to name people because you're gonna get in trouble here. I've given you now five seconds for stalling for the name you've forgotten, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Jane, oh, I can't remember her first name now. Oh, well, you are a Christmas present, but uh, yeah. Helen, um, yeah. who is one of the editors, is not only a climber and a runner, uh, she's a poet, um, and I think that the slant of that on that book was really interesting. So was it a conscious choice to try and make it a mixture of genres? Yeah, we, we, we went out because we knew we weren't going to get women, and I, I could be wrong and I'm possibly not qualified to talk about this, because we thought we weren't going to go and get women to talk about the hardest climbs they'd done and the highest mountains they'd climbed, we went out... And we, we, we asked them to write, a, give us poetry and some prose and some art and even some photography about what they felt the outdoors adventure was like. Poss- not, not really, we didn't want nature writing, we wanted adventure writing. Uh, but we didn't want them necessarily to prove that had an adventure, we just wanted them to say what it was like for them to go trail running or, or like for them to go climbing. And that's... And we just got a lot of contributions, and we got a lot of support, um, and and the book the book came together, and we went for an international approach, and the book the book came came together. Is it doing well? The book the book's done really well. I think I think deserves to. Yeah, it, I think I think, I mean, we've had a lot of support. You know, a lot of people have, have championed the book, which has been great. I think the idea of the book was to get more women writing about the adventures and i think i think the book would have failed if we just published a book sold a load and and moved back to publishing books about the north face of the eiger (laughs) (laughs) blokes in their 50s climbing it Uh, (laughs) so i think the important thing was was for people like ourselves and other publishers to to take on more commissions from women who are doing stuff in the outdoors because if i go mountain biking now there's a lot of women on bikes. If I, if I go enter a fell race now, there's a lot more women doing it. If you go climbing, go down the climbing wall. So it's, you know, why shouldn't they, you know, be encouraged to write more? Yeah, there's a lot more yeah. women in adventure for sure. But as you say, the, the Amazon lists are all men. So with, yeah. your, with your publisher's hat on, so I'm asking you this as a, a publisher, not as a man, cause it's, but as a publisher, um, why are there not more books about adventure by women from the publisher's point of view because you in terms of the submissions you see um and your and the books you sell why are there not more adventure books by women um well i think we'll get 10 times more submissions from men than we will from women so do you know why i think i think i think i think men are uh, I think one reason me- men are risk takers. Men are very good at, at risk at taking risks, and I think two things come from that. One, they get an epic story. Oh, we you know we all risk ourselves, and two of us have come back, and one of us has written the book. So I think they 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 feel they have those adventure stories in them. And I think the other thing, part of being risk takers, is they don't mind writing a book and getting a rejection. Um, and I think it's. I think it's harder. Well, I won't say what it's like for women because I don't really yeah. know. But I think I think that's it. And I think the thing is, I think a lot of women don't see that there's been a huge number of books by women, so they don't necessarily think that you know they can do it um, because you know they have there isn't a huge number of successful adventure books by women. But I think that's changing. We're you know we're certainly seeing a few more submissions since way making and we're, we're taking them on uh so yeah oh thank you i think that, yeah i think that was a really yeah good answer um so you've been going for about 15 years now yep found in 2004 so ish 
So the, this this the chunk of questions I want to ask you about now are all related to a sort of theme that I'm quite interested in in general. So you started this publishing company. Um, were you an expert qualified to start a publishing company? I think we were... Were we 10 years in before the first publishing qualification came into the workforce? <laughs> uh, I d we, didn't know, uh, we didn't know the first thing about publishing. We, we learned what ISBNs were. Ice cream? <laughs> uh, we didn't know the first thing about publishing. Um, and uh, I'll wait for the ice cream van to stuff. <laughs> We so the the very first book came about because uh, I was doing a lot of rock climbing and eating a lot of cake and the two weren't compatible so I had to do something to lose some weight so I I, st I started mountain biking and and I noticed that the guidebooks that I had didn't reflect the kind of riding I wanted to do and they didn't reflect the kind of riders I was meeting out on the trails so I thought well I'll just write a book how hard can it be and we wrote a book I wrote a book and it. And it was very, very successful. It's still going strong. Yeah, it's still it's still going strong. Uh, and we did we did things differently to how everybody else was doing guidebooks, or certainly cycling guidebooks at the time. We put colour photography, and we put young people in. We made sure there was there was women in it. We we made it twice as expensive as the competitive <laughs> titles. We we and we were told that Waterstones wouldn't sell a bike guide over. 10 quid they never had and we were told this and that and we just sold out the first print run in months and 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 we carried on doing that we we, we kept with that policy that we'd go out and we do we, we'd do a book based on our own experience in the outdoors and we, we had a few harry potter moments whereas people sent us books that have subsequently gone on to be number one bestsellers in their categories <laughs> and we didn't publish them because um we didn't understand the market you know it, you know road it's a couple of road cycling books one very famous series of road cycling books which the 100 hill climbs oh they're good they yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well they were indeed submitted to us right and, and they've gone on to sell thousands hundreds of thousands tens of thousands so, of copies was that just a mistake by you it, it wasn't a mistake i think it it was because i didn't go road cycling i don't go road cycling i didn't feel qualified to know if the books were any good or not and you know and i and i think as a publisher i didn't I, if we'd published them they possibly wouldn't have been successful because mm. we wouldn't have known how to do them properly um so i think going back to your question uh yeah we weren't qualified as publishers but we tried to be true to publishing stuff that we understood yeah. and, and now we have people with publishing mas in the business which makes things easier <laughs> does it does it help to have experts i i it it, it uh it definitely helped. For, well, for me, I just employ people who are brighter than me, and then and then stuff happens. Uh, if 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 we just employed people to make me look good, we'd have a load of books with pages missing and spelling mistakes, and <laughs> and they'd be rushed out. So it 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 definitely helps. I mean, we're we're quite a big team now. It definitely helps to have people that are that are experts in their areas. So you started essentially then by finding a something that was missing in your life or a niche that would something that would help you in your life guy this is the guy but i would like i'm going to go on and do it stepped off into the unknown um looking back now would you do it all again or was it just a stupid thing that you did uh i think i think sunday night me and my wife have this this thing where I'm excited that it's Monday morning. I'm going back to work, and she's in dread because it's Sunday night, and she's got, she's got to go back to work. I I, I love what we do. I, I I think it's exciting. You you're just publishing books. I can't wait to get the book out. I can't wait to tell people how great the next book is, uh, and I can't wait to use the books um, that we're publishing and read the books we're publishing because I I think it's just I think people are. Uh, it's just so sad when you see so many fast food takeaways and so many iPads and and all the rest of it. And uh, and I think if if you can get a child, get a kid out on his bike, you know, just cycling down a towpath, 
straight away they're engaged with it. And I think I think if we can write, produce books that get people to do those sort of things, it's it's great. I yeah. feel as though I should be name dropping books here, but I think the point is is getting people out. Yeah, and you've I've read uh, read around about you online, and you say quite a few things often about the positive impact on people's well being and the importance of getting young people out there and exploring. So I think having that consistent thing of this is what we do and just keep banging away at one thing, mm. doing it well is a, a good way to be going at it. Yeah. 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 I also, nine o'clock n- Monday morning is my favourite moment of the week yeah. when I just think, oh, I'm so lucky to be doing something I really, really like. Um, so from starting, having no idea what you're doing, uh, presumably you made all sorts of mistakes, I imagine. Um, maybe you didn't. Uh, but what 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 did you learn looking back about that process of taking a sort of leap into the unknown? I think I think uh, we learned that just because you've produced a, a good book, you can't just replicate that. You can't just go into somebody else's niche. I mean, we, we haven't done a cookery book, but you can't just think, right, I've done a fantastic mountain biking book, the best-selling mountain biking book this country's ever seen. I'm going to do it the same with cookery because you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, we've, we've learned that you've always got to think of the consumer and even using the word consumer is wrong yes you, i was you, surprised you're using that word yeah yeah it's, a, it's straight out of my marketing book i think i think you you've you've got to i think if you're not excited about reading the book yourself or using or going out and doing one of the activities for the walking guide if you're not excited about going out and doing the one the walking guides or if somebody in the office isn't saying kind of when is it back from the printers because i we, we're going to go to pembroke and I, you know, I want to go and do those walks. I've seen the photos on the machines. Um, then that's that's probably the wrong book to do. You you need to have that that love for, for the the books. What what's a what's a big mistake that you've made in the in the last fifteen years that uh, you can look back on and think actually that kind of it was a disaster, but I've learned a lot from that. Do you have any examples? Um, I think we've learned children books are very competitive. <laughs> um, I think I, th- I think the the, the biggest uh, just trying to think what's the, what's the, what's the big the big mistakes um, I think as soon I think whenever we've gone out of our niche uh, of climbing mountaineering trail running mountain biking I think that's when the, the sales haven't been very good because we're competing with with bigger publishers with big budgets. Um, I think I think we always presume a book will do better than it than it does. We okay. Always presume that because you're so excited about the book, and the closer you get to publication, you just get even more excited. Everybody in the world is going to have to buy this book, and then it comes out. I think in publishing they call it the calm bef- after the calm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so gosh. you know, you see, so you, you know, as a, as an author, you write your book and then you wait months or years for the publisher to bring it out, and then nothing really happens. <laughs> One of the things I'm really enjoying about being on my bike right now is forgetting till you reminded me the fact that just recently I've published a book and I'd been in this sort of buy this, buy this, buy this kind of mode with not much happening, and I've really enjoyed ha ah, leave that book behind and go ride my bike for a while. So I'm very well aware of that. Um, so the the thing about the different niches of books, does it bother you though that you're making mountain bike books that sell ten thousand copies? Whereas maybe if you did the great cookbook, you could sell ten million copies. Shouldn't you be trying to sell ten million copies of a cookbook? Um I genuinely don't want to fill the world up with stuff. I think I think there's plenty of stuff in the world and I think I think you can you've just got to get your economies right and you've got to love going into work. And I think when it becomes 10 million copies of a cookbook, it becomes a spreadsheet. And then you you end up just scaling up and then life becomes quite haunting. I think it's... I think one thing when we when we publish a book, if, if we're publishing a mountaineering book, we, we, 
we 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 get pre-orders, you know, and the and they're the same people. And we we when we're putting a book together, we think, is Hannah going to buy this? You know, and it's literally we, you know, uh, you know, or is is Nick going to buy it, or is Alex going to buy it? We know those names, uh, and I think it's it would be a shame to lose that. It'd be a shame if that became, ah, oh, Waterstone's going to put in a pre-order for five thousand copies. You know, are we going to spend money on on window displays? You know, across Waterstone's uh, top city branches. So it 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 would be a shame to lose that in in pursuit of just printing loads of books and also might not work as yeah. you've said you know yeah. one yeah. thing i've really found in my own life of trying to grow an audience and sell books myself as a author was coming to the realization that there are x number of people who might be interested in the kind of stuff i do and there are not a hundred times that amount therefore i need to just accept and be grateful for finding a niche of people who are sufficient for life to work fine and not beat myself up that Ainsley Harriet sells a thousand times more books just because I'm in, it's a different niche. And it took me quite a long time to just accept that and to realize that ah, this is the niche that I operate in and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, uh, it's, uh, you, you, you're not, you know, it's not, you're not going to win the lottery. In publishing, I think if you're a specialist publisher, you you can't have a bit of business model that's based on having a bestseller. You know, it's that is literally like winning the lottery. It's about knowing what you want to do, being realistic about how many people are going to buy that, and and just and just cracking on, and and you know and and have friends, make friends, you know, and 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 support each other. We, you know, all of us publishers and and brands, uh, we're all in this together. And we're competing against YouTube and iPad and, and all the rest of it. And and we you know, we should all work together and support each other. And it's not a zero sum thing, is it? I've noticed that that the more I try and help other people, it doesn't detract from myself. It yeah. kind of builds yeah. and it makes and it's just a nice way to yeah. live life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. People aren't limited to reading one book a year or buying one guidebook. No. Um, but so but speaking about um, massive bestseller smash books. Uh, why did you publish a book about the brown hairs of the Derbyshire Dales? <laughs> <laughs> well, in 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 the in, in and I got into trouble. I got into trouble recently for that very book. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I, I so we should say it's hairs like rabbits, not yeah, hairs. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. I uh, well, I drove back from Manchester late last night, and uh, I immediately slowed my speed as I came over Bur Bur Burbage, because I and then uh, and sure enough, I did see a hair crossing the road. Um, so it, it was a uh, it was a book that was published by Derbysh Wildlife Trust, and it was sold out, and it was going out of print, and that would have been the end of it. And the author got in touch with us and said, "I don't suppose you'd like to take the title on." And of course, and I suppose like, why? Why could we possibly let a book about hares in 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 our in our native Derbyshire go out of print? So we just published it, and and I did get in a little bit of trouble because somebody pitched a book to me, uh, uh, and that it was it was one of those books that you know it was five hundred. I don't know what it was. Five hundred amazing things to do in the Peak District, and it was one of those books that you'll see in gift shops in the Peak District that that just appeals to the tourist market, and and it'll come, and three months later it'll disappear and be remaindered, and that that will be that. And I sort of said, no, it's not really not really the sort of thing we publish. And this and and their retort was, it'll sell more than that book you did about hairs. <laughs> and and I thought, well, but that's not the point. I I want to go to the I I I get something from going into the Peak District and seeing hairs, and you know, we published a book about it so other people can see that. And if it sells ten that's great if it sells 100 that's great i don't really care brilliant i absolutely love it and uh also for my trip cycling around york so far i've seen loads of hairs yeah. and it's brilliant i love seeing hairs yeah. so i think i'm gonna yeah. buy one of those i think it's really yeah, good yeah. um one of the things i'm trying to think about more in my own life is the idea of living adventurously uh because i could think of myself as an adventurer but that changes over time so what what does living adventurously mean to you these days? And perhaps you can compare that to when you were a self-proclaimed pro climber 
in your in your twenties? How's living adventurously changed for you, it, or if if it has at all? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I mean, I was, I'm I'm a father. I've got a fourteen year old son now, and he's 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 just getting independence, and and now I can see what my poor mother went through when I was sort of. 16 and I went off on my first big trip to Canada and 18 when I was mountaineering in Alaska and sort of 20 when I went to Australia, Tasmania climbing for six months and my poor mother, God, I, I'm like panicking now if he disappears on his bike into the woods for an hour. <laughs> um, so I, I think, so, but, so obviously when I was 18, you know, going to Alaska just, just felt, a natural thing to do and I didn't I didn't you know it's, we were quite remote and I didn't see it as, as adventure you didn't you didn't define it as that that was just something we did and, and I, th- I used to hitch over to the Lake District and you know we'd, we'd you'd go for a walk and go for a climb and go for a swim in a tarn I see it's called wild swimming now it's just it was like used to just be swimming <laughs> yes. uh, and yeah we we would be quite quick on the hills and now see that's called fast packing not just walking <laughs> well some might say that going camping has become called a micro adventure yes and other yeah. stupid hashtags yes yeah which is great <laughs> uh and and you know and now uh dare I say it, I'm 50 and uh I I it's I'll I'll find adventure. You know, we've just been on a on a family holiday, which was meant to be a beach holiday, and I can plug my smartphone into somebody's QR code, and it takes me. You know, and I borrow a mountain bike, and it takes me fifty fifty kilometers into the Greek wilderness, and you know, and I feel I feel as I'm having a proper adventure. You know, two three hours away for, uh, away. You know, or you know, one of my great loves is is urban urban walks. Um, you know, you can just be drop your car off for a service and go for a walk walk along the local canal, and you seeing kingfishers and you you know you chatting to fishermen and one thing and another. It's it's just having an experience. An adventure is having an experience. Does, does that count? Is that not just a is that not just a pale imitation of going off to Alaska for six months? <laughs> it's 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 different, but I I I mean it's it's about it's about how you feel afterwards and if, if if you feel content and relaxed and you can just sit down and watch the telly without pacing the room thinking, oh, I wish I was in Alaska, then, you know, that's great. Yeah, and, and is that the case? Does it does a walk along the Don looking for a kingfisher scratch the itch for you? It, 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 it unfortunately embarrassingly does. I mean, it, I, I, I don't think that is necessarily yeah. unfortunately embarrassing. Yeah. Is it? Is yeah. it not just a change? One of the challenging things of my job is, you know, Victor Saunders is is on his way back from K two at the moment, and you know, with it with his manuscript, and I'll have to, let, you know, and Mick Fowler called in the other day, and he's just back from, uh, a tra- you know, he's back from the Himalaya, and he's back from a traverse of of the Matterhorn, and I, you know, and I've been for a walk down the Don, <laughs> uh, but it, it, you know, it it does it does scratch the itch. It's it's getting out there and just just just. You know, it's the adventure. It's just leaving the desk and going to do something. It doesn't have to be Alaska. I'm, as you well know, as, uh, yeah. as I well know, yeah. And I'm so I'm finding this bike trip now because this I'm going to be riding for a month now, which is actually the longest I've been on a bike since I spent four years on a bike. And I'm so much of that my old glory days on the bike are coming flashing back to me now, pootling around, and I'm really interested in that that different feeling of similarities but perhaps the differences as well um but the changing approach to things um i i also find it interesting so how y- your your work side your creativity thing you went from guidebooks to it took you five years before you did your first narrative book revelations so what, what can you tell me a bit about that having a good idea of a work like we're going to make guidebooks this is good and then for that to evolve r- because uh, I've the reason I'm asking this is I've often thought when I have a pattern of doing things, when I change that, that feels to me like a weakness, which I think is a bit dumb. I th- I always thought guidebooks are a little bit disposable. I think I think you can just do a guidebook, uh, and we enjoyed doing them. And I think uh, I, I when I was thirteen or fourteen, somebody took me climbing, and I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. 
and I hoovered up literature and I read every book I could get my hands on and those books stayed with me. Nanga Parbat Pilgrimage, Reinhold Messner's book, Joe Brown's book, Tom Willens' book, all those books stayed with me, the Tillman books. And it took me five years to have the confidence to feel we could do a piece of mountaineering literature and do something and do it right. I, 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 you know, I really did think we were, we would, we were, if we were going to add to that, that canon of literature, you know, we had to know what we were doing. And it, um, possibly didn't think that at the time. I just, I just thought it just took me that, that long to be confident that we, we would do a good book. Okay. Uh, I mean, I always wanted to do mountaineering literature. And, you know, when, when we took on our first employee, uh, to, to specifically help with the production of the books, John Cofield, you know, that was pretty much at the interview. I said, look, John, I want you to help me get mountaineering literature out. We can do guidebooks. Anybody can do guidebooks. But I want to do some mountaineering. I want to do some literature. I want to do some some inspiring okay, literature. You felt you needed to sort of serve your apprenticeship of yeah, putting stuff out yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, um, You said that um, enjoying what you do and being passionate about what you do is a lot better than being good at what you do and that that phrase jumped out at me because i it, it made me pause to think is that right do i is it better to enjoy it and be passionate than to be good at it um and it interests me because i always think that i'm not very good at anything i'm just a bit of a bumbling enthusiast chasing the enthusiasm side so what what's uh do you, st- do you still stand by that random quote I found on the internet of yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I do tell my son now, you know, if we're going to do a park run together or something, I, do, I just say, look, you're not going to win, you know. Oh, uh, that's a good uh, and, pep talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to win. You might as well give up now. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I think with my climbing, I think with my climbing, it, I I always enjoyed climbing. I got more from climbing with people that are better from better than me, and I got more from climbing for myself and and achieving things for myself than I did about being the best or trying to do new routes or get my face in the magazines. Um, so I I think if 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 to try to answer the question, I think if you're enthusiastic and passionate about publishing a book, then that will come through in the book. And then perhaps become a good yeah, book. Yeah, and and will will be a good book. I think if you if you know if you want to be technically the best climber or technically the best runner on the track, what does that mean? Um, you know, I think, I think, I think the other thing is is you know done is better than perfect. <laughs> oh gosh, that's so true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my final question for you, also a quote from the internet of yours, which you can uh, deny or not, which I love, is this. Um, I'm not a fan of self-styled adventurers sucking up the oxygen while building social media followings and doing motivational talks. I which, can't believe I said that, Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> which amused me because that's basically my life. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, what, tell me a bit about self-styled adventurers. I, I think well so 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 part of it it probably comes from ego my you know so obviously I I, I as a rock climber and, and climbing apprenticeship and we it's all about you know so ignoring what I said about the last question it's all about the grade yeah so you the ego, you, yeah. You, you, you know you definitely you definitely judged on what your hardest climb is and I I I always found I was at a film festival last year and and a, a, a very famous. Russian mountaineer, extremely famous Russian mountaineer, came up to me, and and, and he said, well, "What's the hardest you've climbed?" And it and it became a who climbed the hardest rock climb thing, and it, and and all of a sudden I was a better climber than he was, because I'd climbed I'd climbed a harder rock climb grade than he'd climbed, and yet I'd not climbed any eight thousand meter peaks in winter. Have you climbed Mount Everest? <laughs> and, uh, indeed, indeed. Talking, I have to lie. About that I, question. I have to lie when people ask me if I climbed Mount <laughs> Everest. Um, so, uh, at the, uh, we, 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 well, so we get a lot of people, uh, who have, who have essentially trekked to Everest Base Camp or possibly summited Everest and send us their memoirs and we don't tend to publish them. Uh, there are a lot of people, you know, you know, who, who are self-styled adventurers and 
they're not really doing anything uh, other than going on 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 holidays and writing about it. And I think I think that's quite good. I, and I think I think it's a fine line, Alistair. And I think you're probably you're probably. Don't above, worry, you don't need. It. I don't need yeah. any disclaimer in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and and I, uh, you know, and and I think I think vertebrate do tend to publish books from people who you know who, who have achieved a certain amount of thing in what they do. Um, uh, you know, they've done something notable in in what they've done, rather than just being an experienced uh, experience the the landscape. Um, final question for you then is. Um... Five years from now, what's the uh, what's the vision for a uh, first Brits? I've always been quite bad strategically. I probably would have been a better climber had I had a plan rather than just gone out climbing every day. Uh, I, th- I think I think I'd like to think would be have a much more comprehensive series. You know, so with my business hat on, a much more comprehensive series of guidebooks, so people could could rely on vertebrate to, to take them to places they wanted to go and there'd be a book, there'd be a vertebrate book to take to take them there. Um I think I think we'd be letting ourselves down if if we didn't publish more books by by women and, and more people that were having adventures in places rather than just ticking ticking peaks and numbers. Okay. Well thank you very much for uh, giving me your time uh, this morning and also for putting out into the world many books that I've really, really enjoyed um, in a really important niche. So thank you very much, John. Thanks, Alistair. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Living Adventurously. There's show notes from every episode on my website, alistairhumphreys.com slash podcast. If you have enjoyed it, please take a screenshot of your phone and pop it up on social media or leave a review with your podcast provider. It makes a massive difference. Thank you very much. I teamed up with Kamut to make this podcast happen. In case you missed it, Kamut is an outdoor planning and navigation app that helps you explore more of the great outdoors. One of the many ways Kamut helps you have better adventures is with sport-specific routing. Kamut doesn't just plan any route. Oh no, Kamut plans your route. Select your sport, choose your start and end points, and Kamut plots a route using the best option for you. Whether that's smooth asphalt for your road bike, quiet gravel tracks for some chilled mountain bike riding or bike touring, or a road-free trail for your walk or ramble. After that, you can personalise your route even more by dragging the pins on your desktop screen or app to include your chosen destinations along the way of your adventure. Your very own outdoor experiences are waiting for you. Go explore more with Kamut. Head to kamut.com G and use the voucher code ADVENTUROUS to claim your free region bundle.